Make sure you get a palm cross. You can get a palm cross to take with you if you'd like. We have lots of them available. Lots of palm crosses available. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, no, it's okay. Let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and get started. We can uh, begin thinking about our last study for Abraham uh, for the term. So let's uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace toward us. Thank you for your mercies even today of bringing us to this place, to fellowship and to hear your word and receive the Holy Communion. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would form us today and continue to form us by your spirit, that we might believe on your name and might walk with you always. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this past Wednesday night, uh, we looked at some of the Old Testament passages, particularly in which Abraham is mentioned, other than the passages where he's mentioned in the book of Genesis. Of course, the narratives about Abraham are all found in the book of Genesis, um, as we've been reading through this Lenten season, and he comes up a few times other than in Genesis. He comes up uh, typically when somebody is praying, or when there's a prophecy in which God is uh, admonishing the people. Um, but as we looked at those various passages on Wednesday night, we noticed a couple of things. We noticed, um, first of all, that Abraham is mentioned in recounting the history of God's people. Of course, Abraham is a central figure in the history of God's people, um, as the one that God called and um, called out from Ur of the Chaldees, and to whom God gave the promises. A second, we saw that Abraham is mentioned as father. Very often in the prayers, we hear things like, you are the God of our fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Um, and in that sort of appeal, what God's people were doing, whether it was David or Nehemiah or those who were praying, is they are looking back at God's identity as the giver of the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, those who are following after are seeing their identity is grounded as the, in, the, in the fact that they are the people who are also heirs to those promises. Okay? Um, Abraham is mentioned in the Old Testament passages, particularly in the Psalms, but a couple other places as well, as a sign of God's faithfulness, that God is faithful to keep his promises. And then also, um, go, kind of going along with that, Abraham... Uh, functions as a sign of both the faithfulness of God, but also of the right response of human beings to God. The right response of us to God is that we believe God and trust in Him. We noticed on Wednesday night particularly that a lot of those prayers from the Old Testament that mention Abraham function a lot like the collects in our prayer book. You know that, notice that in the collects in our prayer book, it often will begin with an acclamation to God. Almighty God! who, and then says something about what God is like or what God does. And often in the Old Testament prayers, Abraham is mentioned in that place. You, O oh God, are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of our fathers. Therefore, is the way the logic goes, therefore, do this. Therefore, keep your promises. Therefore, be with us. Okay. Um, and this is important for us to remember and understand, because what we're going to look at today mainly in the time we have together are two poems in Luke chapter 1, in which we're going to see Abraham mentioned again. Uh, we may, if we have time, get to the Galatians passage on the back, Galatians 3, on the back of your handout. We may not uh, get to that passage today, um, which will be okay. But the main thing I want to focus on are those two uh, passages in Luke chapter 1. And part of what we're thinking about today is, how is it that Abraham and the promises given to Abraham point us forward to Jesus, and how do they point us forward, particularly as we're here on the cusp of Holy Week, to Jesus' passion? 
How do they point us forward to uh, Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection? Now again, remember those promises made to Abraham. The promises made to Abraham involve land. I'm going to give you a land, God says to him. They involve seed. You're going to have an offspring, a descendant. And they involve blessing. You are going to, through that seed, be a blessing to all nations. Okay? And we see, as we study Abraham's life, a fulfillment of each of those things in a particular way. Um, Abraham lives in the land. Although, really the promise is that the land is going to be inherited by his offspring, by his seed. He doesn't actually inherit the land in his own lifetime, in the sense that he doesn't own it all. But he does live in it. And you may remember, even right the, near the end of the narrative, after Sarah dies, his wife, what does Abraham do to bury her? He buys a place. He buys a place within the land, right? which is a sign of faith. It's a sign of that promise that this piece of land that he now owns, where Sarah is buried, that's going to be expanded uh, for his descendants when they come into that land. And then also, um, Abraham was to be a blessing to the nations. And we see that only in uh, perhaps uh, uh, little ways in Abraham's life itself. But we do have it, for instance, in the ways that he deals with Abimelech and some of his other dealings with the nations. But Abraham is a blessing. All of those things are, of course, signs of the ways that he ultimately, through his seed, is going to be a blessing. Now, as I said, one of the things I want to spend some time looking at today, particularly, and one of the reasons why, um, sorry, I was looking for my prayer book here. One of the reasons why uh, I wanted to look at Abraham, particularly during Holy Week, was, or uh, through the Lenten season leading up to Holy Week, is the ways in which Abraham is mentioned, particularly in Luke chapter 1. He's mentioned in our, uh, in our prayer book. If you pray morning and evening prayer, you're probably mentioning Abraham a lot because Abraham gets mentioned in two of what we call the canticles, which are these poems that we say in response to the readings of the, of the scriptures. Abraham gets mentioned in a couple of those. And so I want to look at, okay, how is Abraham mentioned? Why is Abraham mentioned? What is, why, does that, why does that matter? Okay, so the first one I want to look at is what we call the Benedictus. It's in Luke chapter 1. Verses 68 and following, or it's on page 14 in the prayer book. The Benedictus on uh, page 14 in the prayer book. Um, when do we say the Benedictus? It's, the op it's one of the options to say after what? Yes, after one of the readings in morning prayer, after the second lesson in morning prayer. So it's a point to be read. So typically when we pray it all together, we say the Jubilate Deo um, when we're praying all together. But it, this is one of the options to be said when you're praying morning prayer, the Benedictus. Now, uh, I'll read it. Or actually, can somebody read it for me? Somebody like to read the Benedictus for us? Or actually, let's all say it together. That's even better. Page 14, let's say it all together. That way we all can read, which is good. On page 14 in the prayer book, I think it's, it is a, it's a prayer book translation, I believe, yeah, which goes back to the, the, the original Reformation era prayer books. All right, let's, uh, let's say it all together. The Benedictus on page 14, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear 
in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Very good. All right. Who said this? And when, in the context of Luke chapter 1, who was it who said this, and why, and when? You can look in your Bibles if you want. You don't have to just... Yes. So it's Zechariah says it. Yeah, Zechariah. Sometimes I think the King James translates his name Zechariah, but Zechariah, we would say. So who's Zechariah? Father of, John. father of John. We call him John the Baptist. So he's the father of John the Baptist. So Zechariah, father of John the Baptist. When does he say this? When, when he can speak again. So remember, um, after John has that experience, sorry, Zechariah has that experience where he's in the temple. He's performing his service as a priest in the temple. And the angel appears to him. And the angel says to him what? You're going to, you and your wife, you're going to have a son. And he's like, what? I don't know about that. And he says, well, you are. And, um, but you're not going to speak again until it happens. And so he comes out of the temple, and he doesn't speak. And thanks be to God, his wife becomes pregnant um, with, of course, John the Baptist. Um, and he says this immediately after, remember, that even comes down to they were going to name him, all the people around were going to name him what? They're going to name him Zacharias after his father. But he wrote on a tablet, because he wasn't speaking yet, his name is John. And they're like, what? No, I, no, I mean, what, come on. There's no one in your family with that name. And he's, he wrote again, his name is John. Right? And then he's able to speak. And this is what he says. So he says this, this, this is a song. It's a poem that he, he gives. It's a prophecy that Zechariah gives. Um, and perhaps he sang it. I, I mean, I, all of these, te- by the way, Luke chapter 1 is really wonderful because there are the people constantly bursting into song in Luke chapter 1, right? Um, Zechariah sings, Mary sings, Simeon sings. Um, it's really wonderful. So I actually, I think, yeah, he sang it. Um, what's that? Plain yeah, plain chant, right, exactly. He plain chants it. Um, and what does he say? What is the content of what he says? So now he's there with his wife, They're both elderly. They have this little baby. What does he say? He blesses God. Why does he bless God? God's kept his promise. Good. What promises has God kept? Yes. Yes, good. He praises God for a host of things. Um, one of the things he praises God for, this is all in light of the fact that his wife is holding this little baby as they're all there, right? Um, blessed be, and he speaks to the child, thou child. When he says thou child, who's he speaking to? He's speaking to his son. Right? Thou child shall be the prophet of the highest to go before his way. Um, it's interesting, he starts with, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of them that hate us. Who's he talking about there? Jesus. Where's Jesus right now? In the womb of his mother. Um, probably, 
Yes, right. I think that's right. I, I think because when he starts out, he says, you raise up, he says in the house of the servant of his servant David, which no, I don't believe so. They're cousin, there's, so there's some sort of cousin relationship there, but presumably Zechariah himself is a Levite as a priest. Um, but there is, you know, some overlap there in the sense that of, of Mary's um, relation to Elizabeth. They're, they're, they're related. Um, I just think it's, it's fascinating to note here at the beginning, okay, he's, he's talking about little in, in utero Jesus, right? You've raised up. Now, how does he know about Jesus? Mary came and stayed with them before John was born. Remember, Mary goes to visit Zacharias and Elizabeth. After she becomes pregnant, remember, the, the angel says to her, your kinswoman, your cousin, Elizabeth, I think it was six months along at that point. It says she's six months along, and so Mary goes and spends the first three months of her pregnancy with, with Elizabeth, with Zechariah. So, perhaps, although I need to check what the text says because I th- thought that perhaps she went back before the child was born, but, you, but possibly you're right. Um, yes, maybe she is. Um, that might be. Um, It doesn't clearly say, it does say in verse 56, Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. And then it talks about, sorry, did I say verse 58, verse 56? And then it talks about Elizabeth giving birth. But uh, by the time now it comes to be where they're having this, uh, this time to name him eight days after he's born, maybe Mary has come back. It's possible. The text doesn't say. So it could be. It very well could be. At least we know that Zechariah and Elizabeth they believe Mary <laughs> um, and what is happening with Mary, that, he's the, that Mary's bearing the Messiah. And that's why he prophesies of his son that his son is going to be the prophet. Now, oh yes, David. I believe... Yeah, it's a it's a good question, and I'm not sure. It's a great question, and I'm sure that there is a reason. Um, well, it's verse thirteen. You call his name John. I don't. I, I'm not sure. I think it's a great question, and I do think that there is a significance there. Okay, which is very fitting. Yahweh has been gracious both in the sense that God has been gracious generally. God's been gracious to Zechariah and Elizabeth. God's been gracious to Mary. Um, God's been gracious to all of the people. So I think that that is very fitting, that that is the name given to John. Um, So what is specifically the... The thing that's promised here about Dave, uh, about Abraham, what's said about Abraham here? Why does Zechariah reference Abraham? That's that's who the promises were given to that are being fulfilled. Now, how does he characterize those promises? What does he say about the promises? So he says that, that they had been sworn by, by oath. When did God swear an oath about the promises? The animal split. That's the swearing of an oath. Right? Uh, good. The splitting of the animals is actually, the, and you can see even in each of the, sta- each of the parts of the covenant or the, each of the stages of the unfolding of that covenant with Abraham, there's a covenant of circumcision as well, you know, the, the sign of that is a sign of oath. And then when after uh, God provides the ram in Genesis 22, God swears again. Right? 
But God has sworn by oath to give promises to Abraham, to perform the mercy to our forefathers, to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath he swore to our forefather Abraham, that he would give us, that he would give us what? Salvation from our enemies. Salvation from our enemies. Who are the enemies? Everyone else. Everyone else. Yes, everyone that's opposed to Israel. Everyone else, it seems, are the enemies on one level. Okay, on another level, who are the enemies? On another level, the enemies, particularly in light of what Jesus goes on to do. And particularly Abraham's a blessing to the nations. He is, the enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And what he is going to do, what Jesus is going to do, is going to actually cause it so the Gentiles can be grafted in to the vine um, of God's people. That we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. So what else, it seems, is part of that promise to Abraham? That they'd be a holy and righteous nation, that they'd be a holy and righteous people. Which is part of the blessing, I would say. That's part of the, ble- that's part of the blessing that comes to the nations that's promised to Abraham. That God's people might serve him. Without fear. without fear. Yes. How can you serve him without fear? You serve him without fear if someone has made peace with God. Because otherwise, you would serve him with fear. Um, but if you serve him without fear, it's because you don't fear his judgment because someone has taken that judgment. Okay. Yes. 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 Very good. Very good. So, yeah, so he was, this was, he was told, and this is part of his faithfulness, that when everybody else is insisting, which, of course, that's not their fault, right, that they're all insisting, like, oh, we should name him, this is old man who has this baby, and everybody else is insisting, oh, we're going to name him, no, you should name him Zechariah. And they say, and he writes down there, John, they're like, why are you talking about Nobody else in your family has it. Come on, no, no, no. We want to name it after you. You're like, it's right. You're this, you're this old man of this baby. This is great. Right. Yes, that's right. And it's interesting that it's after Zechariah insists on it that that's when he then can speak. Right. He can speak after he insists against everybody else. Who are all well meaning. I don't think anybody, I don't, you know, the family's not acting badly when they say, no, we're going to name him Zechariah. They're all very well meaning, but, but his insistence, no, his name's John. So the text says, um, uh, Gabriel says to him, so uh, Zechariah says to the angel, verse, chapter 1, verse 18, How shall I know this? I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, so this is the way he's going to know it. Um, yeah, right, you would think you would know that too. But the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. Yeah. He still couldn't speak. <laughs> right. Probably was. The baby's born. <laughs> yeah, right. He's insisting, like, that baby's going to be named John. Yeah, long eight days. Right. The baby's going to be named John. That's for sure. Um, and the text says, the people were waiting for Zechariah, um, wondering at his delay in the temple. When he came out, he was unable to speak 
and they realized he'd seen a vision. He kept making signs to them and remained mute. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it would. Now, it, the text does say that he served the rest of his time in the temple and then went home. But he's unable to say the Psalms and say the prayers the way that he would have with the rest of his group. Um, Yes. Yeah, everybody, yeah, the text says everybody knew he'd seen a vision <laughs> um, because when he came out, he couldn't, he couldn't speak, and he was making these signs to them. Who knows what that was like? I wish I could see what the signs were like <laughs> that Zechariah was... Uh, right. Probably everybody, probably he could have, he probably eventually was writing to them, but the text says when he came out, he was making signs to them. Um, Probably the priest did. Um, so it's interesting that, this is just a complete aside, the, the literacy level among just general people in first century Israel was probably higher than other parts of the ancient world simply because of the fact that the religious, religion was based so much in the text. And so, um, yeah, but it's, but it's a good point. Like, it's not like universal literacy by any means. Um, and, and, but yeah, yeah, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting question, or a very interesting idea, too, that maybe even some of the priests were like, oh, what's he, he's like right, signing stuff and writing stuff, I don't know, what, what's all this going on? Yeah. All right, so that's, that's the first one I wanted to look at. The second one I wanted to look at, um, and we'll look at this one very quickly, is one you're also f- quite familiar with. And this is Mary's song, the Magnificat, Luke chapter 1. So that's on page 26 in the prayer book, and let's say that one together as well. Page 26, the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath hope in his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham, and his seed forever. All right, this is, uh, when does Mary say this? So this is is the the, the Annunciation, right? The, The angel comes to Mary and says, you're going to be with child. And her response to that, after she responds by saying, may it be um, to me, um, let it be to be according to your word, verse 38. Um, the angel departs from her, um, and she goes then to visit Elizabeth. In those days, the text says, Mary arose and went in haste to the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then what's Mary do? She sings. She sings this song, the Magnificat. Um, What's that? She, was working on it on the bus. she must have been working on it on the bus, right, on the way over. She's like, what am I going to say when I see Elizabeth, right? 
So this is the thing that Mary uh, says in response to Elizabeth's um, acclamation of her, her welcome of her. Um, and what does Mary say? We just read it. Summarized for me what, what she says. She praises the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. Why does her soul magnify the Lord? Yes, good. Again, there's this reference to the promise. Right? Um, Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. That through what God is doing, God is exalting the poor and the lowly. Right? Um, he that is mighty hath magnified me. His mercy is on them, on them that fear him throughout generations. He has showed strength. And who has he showed strength to? Yes, his servant Israel, who's also identified with the humble and meek. That's right, but you're right. That's right. It is Israel that he showed this mercy to. Um. Yes. In Zechariah's song, you serve him without fear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. To put this in perspective, it's been silent for 400 years. Right. Right. No anybody. Right. And this little girl gets visited by an angel. Right. Yes. yes. You have, but well. There's, there's nothing to compare to. It doesn't matter which angel. It, it's, it is highly significant. This is absolutely right. This is a very good point. It's highly significant. There's been 400 years of silence. And then the first prophecies you get are an old woman and a little, she's not a little girl, but you know what I mean. An old woman and a, and a very young woman. An old woman and a young woman are the ones who give this prophecy, which goes back to Joel, where Joel says that your, your old women and your young women are going to dream dreams, and they're going to say there's going to be prophecies. Um, they, right, but then interestingly, he can't say anything. <laughs> but that's right, but you're the first thing that comes. Yeah, it comes to Zacharias in the temple. Right. Right, right, which is partly of this, one of the things that Mary's song, The Magnificat, does is it, it, it's sort of about turning the world on its head, right? Mary talks about, um, he has showed strength with his armies, scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from his seat. So the mighty, the strong one, the proud one, who's up on the high seat, who thinks, ah, I'm up above everyone, I reign over everything, what happens to him? He's brought down. And who's exalted? The humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, the rich he hath sent empty away. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't speak until later. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Yes, David. I think he's just one of the priests. So Zechariah is one of the priests. So he, um, it was his cycle to come and serve at the temple because in this period of time, um, there may have been thousands of men actually that were qualified to be priests because one of the things that qualified you to be a priest was your descent. 
So if you're a Levite uh, and you are ordained to it, you can be a priest. And so there were, there may have been, which is actually one of the things that's interesting about this is it's possible that when Zechariah goes into the temple to offer the incense, which is where he is, right? It's possible that was the only time in his service as a priest that he ever did that because there were so many priests. They're all in this big cycle. It's possible that was the only time he went in the temple, into that part of the temple to actually offer the incense. And we don't know that for sure. The text doesn't say that. But it's possible based on the number of priests that we think that there were at the time. So, well, so it would have been in the temple, yes. So probably, yeah, because there would have been people coming from different parts of, of Israel to, to perform this service. The text says when, they, when uh, Mary goes to the house, she goes to the hill country of Judah, which means uh, that uh, he presumably doesn't live very far away from Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, uh, you mean Zechariah? Yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah, could be. Could be. Okay, as we're thinking about it, why does she then mention, she's talking about all these things, why does she then mention Abraham? Abraham. Abraham. Yes, because she's carrying his seed. Remember his mercy. He, remembering his mercy, hath hope in his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham and his seed forever. Now, one way, of course, interpreting seed is just descendant, right? Or descendants. But we're not going to look into this now because we're over time. But in Galatians chapter 3, um, I'm surprised, yes. In Galatians chapter 3, um, Paul makes a big deal of the fact that in the Old Testament, it said that the promise comes to the seed, not to the seeds. He makes this big deal about the fact that it's singular and not plural. And Paul says, because it's singular and not plural, the seed who the promise comes to is one, meaning Christ. So when Mary then says, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham and his seed forever, she is there referring to Israel, who's getting the promises, but she's also referring to the true Israelite who she bears in her womb who's come as the inheritor, the true inheritor of the promises. Yeah, that's right. And even to the promise all the way back. Yeah. That she, that, um, that he is the heir to it and the one who's going to enact it, his promises. And we see he's going to enact it because he's going to take the mighty off their seat and exalt the humble and meek. So, much more we can say. We're not going to go into the Galatians passage now, but if you are uh, wondering what to do this afternoon, you can, uh, you can read that Galatians 3 passage there I printed on the text. Um, but I just want to point out these gospel canticles, right, the, the Benedictus, the Magnificat, one of the ways we use them now is because what we're saying when we say those in response to the reading of Scripture is that those promises that we hear in the Scriptures, those things that are true about God that we hear in the Scriptures, we are now receiving, like Zechariah and like Mary. And the other thing I want to point out just very quickly is notice how Zechariah and Mary, when they receive this promise, their reflex is to ground their response to it in the history of Israel. Their reflex is to ground the response in what God has done, what God's already said to their forefathers. And I think that's really important for us as Christians to see. Because that should be our reflex too. Our reflex should be, okay, things that are happening to me, how is this grounded in the promises of God, in what God has done, what God promises to do? Right? Yeah, Mary's probably a teenage woman, young, young girl. And yet, when she gets this promise, and she says this song, she grounds the reality of it 
in what's been said to Abraham. Right? Um, the, this, is the, this is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. And so we too can walk in that same faith as they did before us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please, we pray, give to us faith and hope and love that we may walk in the promises that you have given to us. Please, as we enter into this, into this holy week, uh, please uh, cause us, we pray, by your grace, to grow in faith and hope and love that we might glorify you in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.